these guys, right? These and these guys. This guy corresponds to this positive event and this negative event that was chosen here, right? So if you look at, at how we drew this chart, whenever we whenever we went up here, that was because we had found this guy that was positive, and whenever we moved to the right of above this rectangle, it was because we found this guy that was negative. So the only thing that that will describe every single one of these rectangles under the curve is that we chose a positive event at random, we chose a negative event at random, and the positive event was ranked higher than the negative event. That's why we saw it first. If you take any one of these points, you will see that the positive event was, was seen here, the negative event was seen here. So that means that the positive event was seen first, and the negative event was seen later. Does that make sense? Because of the way the algorithm group, uh, worked in creating this curve. It said, whenever I see a positive guy, I go up. Whenever I see a negative guy, I go to the right. So this guy means I saw the positive first, I saw the negative second, actually very far after. Uh, whereas if you choose one guy here, let's say you chose this rectangle here, and that means this is, we saw this guy, and we saw this guy, right? This guy was the negative event, the one that made it go to the horizontal. And this guy was the positive event. The negative event was seen first, and the positive event was seen later. So area under the curve is defined as the probability if you pick any positive event, one positive event, and one negative event, that the positive event was found first, or was ranked first in this order. That really means very little, I think. Obviously, as you as you can see from what we're trying to do here, if the AUC is close to one, that means it's a really good curve. If it's close to 0.5, that means your uh, your model is really not good. It's basically ranking them in a in a random order. If they are less than 0.5, especially if they're really close to zero. You yeah. actually have a very good flipped model, right? That's basically saying the guy has cancer when they don't, and the guy doesn't have cancer when they actually do. But it's a still a good model because you just twist around, and it basically you, you twist around, and it flips and uh, over the the diagonal, and then it becomes a very good model. So, so anything anything that deviates from the diagonal, you can turn it into good news. So, a low point five is the guy that gives you bad advice. But point yeah. <laughs> five is a guy that really you can just ignore because whatever he says is random and doesn't mean much. So yeah. below point five, you really should not take that guy's advice. <laughs> <laughs> or better yet, yeah, you should take the opposite of yeah, what he you said. Should and then you have good advice. Oh, you, should just do the opposite. you should buy this stock. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will not buy that. I will not buy that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you'll see from the models that we're comparing now some ROC curves, I guess, when Mark finishes them. And uh, you will be able to maybe compare them a little bit using that that strategy. But we're using these curves, which is really weird, as opposed to these matrices. Because these matrices encode within them the fact that you chose a cutoff point, right? And, and choosing a cutoff point is in itself complicated and, and really it should be left up to the school. The school should be the one that says, hey, look, when you give me um, it's okay for me to have uh, a false positive rate of 20%, which means I'll be wasting 20%. 20% of the students I contact, it will be a waste of my time, because they were really in trouble. As long as you give me a really good positive rate so I can find almost all the students that are in trouble. you know. Uh, but it will be a decision of the school, because they have to figure out how many resources they have, how many students they, you know, they want to call. In that regard, it makes sense that a bigger school, you know, a 10% false positive at city colleges is a lot more work than a 10% false positive at school with, you know, half the students or a quarter of the students. So, yeah. But al although city colleges also have more employees, more real sure. so, yeah. so it's hard so it's, it's to, you know, decide. But, yeah. but it's hard. it should be really up to the person who uses the model to set up the, the point where they do that. Now, it, it so happens if you, you know, we've all been here when uh, Aaron has explained his model, his model uses risk 
and read doesn't go from 0 to 1, it goes from 0 to 0.6 or some number like that. Uh, but it still is able to rank, right? And that's what matters here. So it really doesn't matter, even if, it, if these probabilities are widely, wildly wrong, as long as the order in which they sort the events makes it such that all the positive events come first and all the negative go, go later, they're equally good models in, in the sense that the arrow seeker will show them to be good models, right? And then you can always adjust the risk and say, well, a risk of 0.8 really means a probability of 0.8. Uh, you can actually do that, I think, more or less uh, automatic. That's actually, so, so in some of these um, models, you give it an error uh, in order to make progression, as, as it trains itself, it uses something as an error. <coughs> Using the accuracy as an error would be a really bad idea, it seems like, right? Because, I mean, it essentially... It could be a bad idea. Yeah. Because, it, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It, it could stick, uh, it could leave you when... Because here's the interesting thing uh, as well. Usually <coughs> in most models, the positive event is much more rare than the negative event. Because the positive event really is that is the thing that you don't want to see. The models are usually, uh, for example, positive events might be the click-through rate on a page, right? You want to know which, is the, which people that go to your website click on the, on the buy button, right? And that click-through rate is usually tiny compared to the, the, the guys who don't buy. But so in, in a lot of these models, the event that you're interested in happens to have very low probability. Fortunately for us, well, unfortunately, I don't know many students fail, right? <laughs> so in our case, we're looking for students uh, that, that fail, that are not going to graduate, etc. And it so happens that it's like a huge percentage. So in that sense, our models are not quite as complex as the models for, for example, fraud in credit cards or things things of that nature. Those would also be the positive event. Yeah, so is the AUC commonly used as kind of what you're trying to optimize? Um, that's no, I don't, uh, well, it depends on the thing that is I, I think for most people, when they look at models, and actually what I asked Mark was to, to be able to put them on the same graph, so you could see model one and model two superimposed on the same graph. I think most people, when they see that, they actually are looking for anything that goes closer to this edge is better than anything that goes here, right? And in that sense, the AUC is the mentally, mentally the one that you, you want to look for. But sometimes you say, I am only willing to you know, have a 20% false positive rate because that's what I can afford. And in that case, all you, all you care about is where do they cross this line, right? So somebody might cross it very high here and then be very level. And another guy may cross it low and then do very well here. And, uh, but if this is your, your point where you want to make your decisions, you would say, well, mm -hmm. I want this one. Even though the one did very well later, I'm not going to use that. Right? May have a higher AUC, but may have a higher AUC, but you're only willing to yeah. take this uh, false positive rate. Yeah. So, so it's really like whatever is bigger integrated up to that cutoff point. To that, to whatever cutoff point you have, and that cutoff point may be on uh, maybe a line like this or maybe a line like this, depending on what you're looking for, right? Okay. So you want to find all 90% of the students that are at risk, then you would have to put a line here. At 90 percent, and then see whichever one gets there first. That's the model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, this what Rod said about the ranking and the probability. In our situation, to me, that's the most important thing you got to get right. Those probabilities, or whatever number you put there, need to partition mm -hmm. the students well because the number matters more than which category it is. The number tells you the risk, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. How at risk is this student compared to that student? Uh, and yeah, that's the tricky thing to get right. A lot of these algorithms only care about accuracy or they're tuning just to, they're tuning on accuracy. A lot mm -hmm. of the data mining ones are trying to just say, this is the best I can do. But really, I think we have to find an algorithm that that, that really tries to hone in on the best way to partition the students, almost like a, um, uh, I drew it in peace office, yeah, almost like, I'm thinking of it like a, kind of like a U, like if you think of like a normal curve like this, I'm almost thinking of it like this, where you would go, 
you think of the risk as well there's some folks you really can't tell the risk one way or the other but 